Season three of iRacing just launched this week and they put out a development update. Great video if you wanna see the stuff they're working on and some of the cool stuff they've implemented for this season. What surprised me is they don't have the quad views announcement in here. In my previous video, I introduced this to you guys and I revealed the potential for FPS gains with VR. It was with a Pimax Crystal Light, but this video is gonna focus on a Quest 3. I use my Quest 3 with the Razer head strap because I find it comfortable and I can lean my head back on the seat, which is great for endurance events. And I use the face gasket because I wear my glasses inside the headset and it keeps the lenses a bit farther away, which yeah, I mean, it does reduce the field of view, but I prefer this. We also have a few different ways to go about connecting the Quest 3 and I prefer for a virtual desktop. It's got a great feature set and I find it easy to use. Just make sure you get the wireless version, not the Steam app. As for the official connection method, the Meta app and that stupid link cable and its debris warning have just let me down too many times. Of course, your mileage may vary, but I only run virtual desktop. But the key feature we're looking at today in iRacing is their implementation of fixed foveated rendering. Within your headset, the center of the screens is at a higher pixel count compared to the periphery where it's reduced. iRacing calls this feature MVP and it's being performed early in the pipeline, not later, reducing the render workload right at the beginning. iRacing has implemented the NVIDIA proprietary code for this. Radeon need not apply. But in my previous quad view analysis with iRacing, I used a 9800X 3D as the CPU so that I could evaluate all the graphics cards. It's the fastest CPU for simulators, so this makes sense. But I did find some early evidence that contradicted this statement, that this new foveated rendering doesn't increase CPU usage. And just to clear up some verbiage, Quad view is the same as fixed foveated rendering in this instance. It requires iRacing in open XR mode and iRacing refers to this feature as MVP. Whereas in my previous video, I called it MVR, multi-view rendering, which is just a reference to the whole stack that Nvidia has. So I threw some more processors at this and here are the results. If we just look at the average FPS and the percentage of time the CPU frame times were delivered on time, Wow, that's too much. Uh, basically, the chart's flat. There is no insight by just looking at this. Instead, let's look at the average milliseconds it takes the CPU to complete its work. While keeping all other settings the same, switching from SPS to MVP increases the CPU frame time. And it doesn't matter if it's the red 9800X 3D, the ye yellow or gold 7600X, or my two Intel processors. There's a slight bump up. It would be nice to see this value in the simulator, but unfortunately it's always stuck around 11 milliseconds in iRacing with OpenXR as the renderer. And we'll talk more about this in a second. The reason why we are enabling MVP is so that we can save on GPU frame time, shown here in the bar graphs again. For this testing, I'm using a RTX 5090 so we can push the CPUs to their limits. Even though this graphics card is delivering on-time performance, it gets even better with MVP enabled. If you want to get the most out of a fast GPU like the 5090, you should always pair it with the fastest processor you can get your hands on. And a great way to illustrate this are the wet roads of Portimao. But iRacing has confirmed that SSR, the reflections and the puddles, that's disabled when we enable MVP. Along with SSAO, and FSR. But a big benefit is being able to increase MSAA, which is the aliasing, the eternal enemy of all sim racers. But I have only been using MSAA two times and I'll tell you why a little later. And if I just hit rewind on this benchmark scenario and we compare SPS up top with MVP on the bottom, I can't spot many differences really between these two renders. And as the reflection of the grandstand goes across, um, the track here, I think it provides a really good example that with SSR disabled on both uh, SMP or sorry, SPS and MVP, so many acronyms. Oh my God, uh, just visually there's no difference. But when we look at performance, there's a big difference. Up first, let's look at the 9800X 3D again with the 5090. This is our histogram distribution of GPU frame times. And in the dark red, we see that MVP has a clear advantage over SPS. And if I add in the GPU frame time bar chart, um, we see this confirmed numerically. You could interpret this as gaining about 10% 
in GPU headroom because we've dropped by 0 0.8, uh, 0.6 milliseconds. So now let's look at the 13700K. We've actually lost graphics card performance. We can see in the bar chart that we've slipped about 0.4 milliseconds by going to MVP. And the blue data in the histogram has also slipped closer to our 11.1 .1 millisecond line. That's the 90 Hertz timeline. This data does suggest that MVP did produce faster GPU frame times. And we see that towards the six millisecond uh, mark, but generally speaking, it is delivering worse performance. And the same thing happened with my other CPUs that I tested, the 12600K and the 7600X. Both of these processors also showed better performance from the 5090 when we used SPS. So what's going on here? Like the whole reason why we turned on MVP was to get better performance from the graphics card, not worse. If we look at the CPU distribution of frame times, we can see the problem with the 13700K. The extra compute burden for quad views is enough to push that processor beyond our 11 millisecond timeline and cause late frames. Even with this great addition to the iRacing engine to integrate FFR, unfortunately, the engine itself, the graphics engine, it's still CPU bound in a lot of scenarios. And Rain really showcases that here. Switching to the other processors, we can see the same shift with the 12600K, as well as the 7600X. And then finally, switching back to the 9800X 3D, we can see that even its headroom has been significantly reduced. And if we switch over to look at this data in bar chart form, we can see that difference as well. iRacing has the best rain simulation. It's not even close. However, as we can see, it is leaning hard on the CPU. With MVP enabled, we see the 9800X 3D slip back by 0.8 milliseconds. And then down by the 7600X at the bottom, we actually see it, see it slip by 1.2 milliseconds. So the more CPU bound your performance is, the worse the impact of MVP. And if we flip over to the GPU frame times, we can see the knock-on effect of later CPU frame times. In this benchmark scenario, only the 9800X3D had that extra headroom to take on the performance impact of MVP therefore allowing the 5090 to run faster. The other CPUs did not have this headroom, therefore performance suffers. So when we look at the average FPS, we can understand it. We increased the computational burden on processors that were already at their limit or beyond. Therefore, more late frames from the CPU means less FPS. So if you're pushing your CPU to its limits, even in dry conditions, you could see a performance decrease with MVP enabled. So as an example, let's go through a tuning exercise with the 13700K to see if we can decrease the CPU burden. We have iRacing MVP enabled during this. It's not SPS. The first thing I'm gonna change is the number of cars drawn. I've reduced it from draw all cars, and there's about 30 in this replay, down to 16 in front and four behind. You can directly edit the cars drawn within the INI file. We see a small performance game, and it would be much bigger, say, if there were 50 cars to draw. During a rain race, the cockpit mirrors are basically useless, so switching to a virtual mirror only saves us performance. Now, I can't actually do that in a race in a replay. I just enable one mirror, which is the same load burden, as it were. And you might notice in the right hand side that our on time delivery is now 100 percent, but we're not at 90 FPS. And that just represents the data that I have. I don't have the minute granularity to actually see individual frames and those specific stutters. Regardless, just one mirror is way easier for the CPU to process. Therefore, we get better performance. Last up is the left-hand side of the graphics menu where we have event details and crowds, stuff like that. And reducing these doesn't really change that much of our performance in the wet. But this is also track dependent and we are only at Algarve. If it were me, I would honestly just have virtual mirror as a toggle button. And if there's no one behind me that can pass, I just turn off all mirrors. So the next thing I wanna talk about, it's more of a philosophical discussion about image quality. So the Quest 3 uses dual LCD screens equipped with pancake lenses. This enables the best feature of the headset, which is edge to edge clarity. With the gasket off, I'll try and like shove my phone in here so that you can see some of this. 
It's difficult to hold the headset steady and have the camera stay in focus, but the point is you can move your eyes around in the headset when you're driving and have great clarity even to the edges of the lenses and the screens inside the headset. So I think a lot of Quest 3 users are used to having their head pointed at the apex or whatever they're interested in and then using their eyes to look around at the HUD elements or the dash in their car. And this new rendering technique from iRacing, which they call MVP in the graphics options, this renders your periphery at a lower pixel count. That's where the performance advantage comes from. But it also ruins one of the strengths to the Quest 3, especially because iRacing has not given us access to control the size of the clearest part of the screen or its shape. So if you're used to darting your eyes around the screen, you might be disappointed by this feature, or at least with how it's currently implemented. So how can you evaluate your performance? Virtual Desktop has an easy to read performance overlay, just press down on both thumbsticks and this pops up. And I'm showing it here as seen through the Quest 3 lens because I don't want uh, the capture of the footage to disrupt the simulator performance. But there's a lot of flickering here. So I'm just gonna use the desktop feed and take out the data. Okay, now starting from the top again of the benchmark with the 7600X and the 5090, what we're trying to do here is compare the uh, performance metrics outputted by virtual desktop to those found within the simulator. So the RGT values that many of you are familiar with here in uh, numeric value. And what I wanna show here is the direct correlation that there seems to be between the virtual desktop game latency which is around 17, 16 milliseconds, and how it's fluctuating and matching what iRacing is showing for its R and T values. R generally represents the CPU, T generally represents the overall simulator latency. With this scenario, the 7600X is struggling. Our target is 11.1 .1 milliseconds, and we're not even getting close to that. So now let's apply this same approach of analysis, but go back to Zanvort, where the 7600X could handle it. And just for funsies, I'll add in the frame time chart for the 7600X in this benchmark. But on the right hand side, we see one of the issues with iRacing's OpenXR. Our R value representing more or less CPU performance is locked at 11 and the T is hovering around there too. But we know from frame time data that we have better performance than this. And I think virtual desktops performance overlay showcases that. Our game latency will decrease as we get to the apex and then as we turn back around to the pit lane, it increases. This is exactly what we would expect on monitors if we didn't have G-Sync deployed or FreeSync. The more digital assets there are to draw, the harder it is on the CPU. And as we turn away from the grandstands, from the event details, we can see that we get further uh, CPU improvement. So this performance overlay is getting us that detail that otherwise is lost with the iRacing overlay. If you use the Meta app, uh, which has the Oculus Debug tool, and you can enable that performance overlay, you can get, you can get access to similar um, data metrics. Some of you may also notice that I'm using a resolution greater than godlike, and you can see that with the render resolution at 112%. I use the resolution override function within OpenXR Toolkit to pull this off. So if you have the GPU headroom and you want to have an even crisper image within iRacing, you can go about increasing this value or in the debug tool or whatever other tool you need to use. And here's a side-by-side -side showing that approach. I, I don't know if the YouTube uh, compression will allow you guys to see the image quality difference, but it's very much apparent inside the headset. For example, the buttons in the cockpit, the dials on and the labels on the wheel, it, it's just at a greater clarity because we've increased the resolution. And if you've got the GPU uh, headroom, you can just keep increasing the resolution and make it even more clear. And and in this example, I was also using the default values for these two settings. This changes the clarity within the middle ring and the outer ring. Max value is 50, that would be the best clarity. Minimum value is 25. You can manually adjust these within your renderer DX11 open XR INI file. iRacing is about to give us the first patch to season three, so maybe this will end up in the graphics GUI, I don't know. One of the reasons I picked this uh, higher resolution than Godlike is I wanted to compare the Quest 3 directly to a Pimax Crystal Light at the same resolution. Here's the distribution of CPU frame times, and I have week 13 data when we just got MVP, 
as well as data I just captured a few days ago. This testing was done with the RTX 5090 and the 9800X 3D. Now looking at the GPU histogram, we can see again, similar performance. However, maybe a slight advantage to the Quest 3. I then threw another graphics card at this, my 4080 Super with 16 gigabytes. And for some reason, there's a difference between week 13 performance and week one. I was going to investigate this further. However, my Pimax headset had a firmware update as well as the software. So this is all old data now anyway. I think I'll have to investigate this topic as like a dedicated video. But these preliminary benchmarks suggest that, yeah, I think we can use the GPU analysis I did with a Pimax and apply that to the Quest 3, as long as the Quest 3 is running the same resolution. And the last thing I wanna talk about, it's actually just more of a warning, that if you uh, have your Quest 3 and you enable MVP and it ends up looking like this, this is not normal, there's a problem here. Do not run another fixed foveated rendering technique on top of iRacing's. iRacing has already reduced the pixels. When you apply another layer, you're saying, hey, make the pixels more pixelated. Don't do that. Another thing to watch out for is if you are changing the field of view and cropping. Maybe you're using the debug tool or virtual desktop or another method. Be careful with this because iRacing is not expecting it. And you might end up smushing your field of view and making it all pixelated. And if there's anyone out there looking to upgrade from a Quest 3, I've got a Pimax Crystal Super in a box. I'm trying to get a first impressions video out in a couple days. And Pimax is also gonna be running a discount campaign later this week, so stay tuned to the channel. If you need help with your VR, reach out via email or support my channel below.